you're going to have no problem connecting the dots to the issues that you face every day as individuals, as leaders, the challenges that your teams are facing. You're going to have no problem seeing yourself and your teams in, the, in this discussion. Now, I'm also, NASA has provided me with two great tragedies to draw from to make some points, uh, those tragedies being the Challenger disaster and the Columbia disaster. Now, Columbia, the Space Shuttle Columbia was lost seven years ago this past uh, February 1st, and I think most people are kind of familiar with uh, the loss of Columbia. Uh, eight, it sustained heat shield damage during ascent and two weeks later burned up on reentry. I'll expand on that disaster later in this program. But I think most people have a general understanding of what brought down Columbia. Whereas Challenger, and you're going to be surprised to hear this, Challenger goes back 24 years this past tw January 28th. A long time in the past. Many of your memories, I'm sure, have faded with exactly what it was that caused the loss, that caused the loss of Challenger. And because I will be referencing that disaster in this program, I want to take a few minutes right now to briefly review for you, mechanically, what brought down Challenger. Challenger was a result of the failure of the right-hand solid rocket booster. Look at the size of these things. 150 feet long, 12 feet in diameter, and each of them weighs 1.3 million pounds. They're made in Utah, launched in Florida. You cannot transport an object this large as a single piece ac across North America. So these things are made in four propellant filled pieces that are shipped separately by flatbed, flatbed rail car from the Thaikal plant in Utah down to the vertical assembly building at Cape Kennedy. There these segments are stacked on top of each other and bolted together to form twin towers of boosters. Uh, the gas tank is hung between the boosters. Uh, the, the winged vehicle, the orbiter, is attached to the gas tank and then all of this is taken out to the launch pad on this 12 million pound mobile launch platform. Now when these boosters ignite, they burn at 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit and at a pressure of about 1,000 pounds per square inch. Steel boils at 5,000 degrees. So you have to ensure in your design that the steel of the booster is never touched by the fire that it contains. So there's insulating material to run the inside length of these segments. The obvious weak point in the design is where you've bolted those segments together because there you have a potential leak path for the gas to pass to the outside, melt the steel, and cause a catastrophe. Now, I'm not going to go into the engineering specifics of the joint design that was intended to prevent such gas leakage, other than to say it was based on a redundant, flexible O-ring scheme. Two flexible O-rings at the perimeter and grooves at the perimeter of each of these segment joints were to form a steel-to-steel -steel pressure seal to prevent the fire from leaking out. Your faucets at home have O-rings serving an identical function. They form steel-to-steel -steel pressure seal to prevent water leakage. On Challenger, both O-rings failed on the bottom segment of the right side solid rocket booster at ignition. This is Challenger coming off the launch pad. Look at that circled area. You'll see that black smoke. That's the vaporized O-rings being shoved out that bottom joint. You now have 5,000 degrees eating into the outer wall. As the rocket flies higher, the gas is vaporizing a bigger and bigger hole in the side of the booster rocket. 73 seconds up. The rocket comes apart, uh, killing the seven astronauts seen, seen in this photo right here. Okay, you're going to need that background to understand some of my downstream comments, and certainly you're going to need it to understand my comments on normalization of deviance. What is this? Well, it's that natural human tendency, particularly in pressure circumstances, to want to take shortcuts, to accept a deviance from established standards. Uh, it, the pressure you're under could be uh, family pressure, there's some distraction at home that's putting you under pressure, uh, could be budget pressure, schedule pressure is certainly a huge hammer. But it's a very human thing to find yourself in a pressure circumstance. You've been trained to meet standards that are here. Uh, you expect your team to meet standards that are here. And now because of this pressure you're under, you start this rationalization that because of this pressure, I'm not going to be able to meet those standards. My team, I won't be able to lead my team to meet these standards. I'm going to have to deviate from them. I'm going to have to take a shortcut. And you may say to yourself, oh, I'm only doing it this one time. Next time I'll go out and I'll execute the way I know I've, I'm supposed to. I'll, I'll meet, meet those standards. So you take that shortcut. You accept that deviance from established standards. And guess what the consequences are? None. Not immediately. Nothing bad happens. Boss doesn't yell at you. Uh, there's absolutely no negative the customer's not jeopardized. There are absolutely no immediate negative, negative consequences to taking that shortcut, to accepting that deviance from established standards. What does that do? Very subtly, but immediately, it starts forming this false feedback in your brain and in the brain of the team. And that is, the absence of something bad happening when I accepted that deviance means it was okay to do so. 
What's going to happen the next time you find yourself in these same pressure circumstances? And there's always a next time. Because there were no negative consequences the first time you accepted that deviance, you're going to be mightily tempted to do it again. And you do it enough times, folks. You get away with it enough times, your teams get away with it enough times, and slowly, over time, what happens? The shortcut becomes the norm. Here's where you're supposed to be in meeting standards. Here's where your teams are supposed to be. Here's where you are. Here's where they are. This deviance is now invisible to them. It's automatic to accept the deviance to take the shortcut. And what happens with normalization of deviance, folks, is it leads to predictable surprises. And in almost all cases, folks, the predictable surprise is not very pleasant for the team. And if you ever want an object lesson in a predictable surprise and what normalization of deviance is capable of doing, look at Challenger. Challenger was no accident, folks. Challenger was a predictable surprise. The time that rocket came apart, scattered throughout NASA and killed the crew, uh, scattered throughout NASA and, NASA and her contractors and filing cabinets and desk drawers were written documents, memos, predicting the exact thing that did happen, i.e. failure of the O-ring was going to happen. Where did people get the information to make such predictions? From the best source available, flight data. It doesn't get any better than to get the piece back and see how it performed. And that's the case with these solid rocket boosters. They're not throwaway items. 25 miles up, they burn out, they're jettisoned, they have gigantic parachutes that are deployed, air is trapped inside these tubes when they hit the water so they temporarily float, tugboats are positioned out there to put a line on them, tow them back to shore, there they are cleaned up, taken apart, inspected, and used over again. The operative word in this process is inspected. And on 14 of 24 missions before Challenger, Challenger was number 25, on 14 of 24 missions before Challenger, in the inspection process, quality assurance and safety people noted that the O-rings, which were never designed to be touched by fire, were being touched by fire. And they understood the ramifications of their findings. This design is flawed, it's going to fail, and people are going to die. And they basically put words to that effect in these various memos. I want to share with you excerpts of two of these memos, both of which were written by Thicol engineers, the contractor, to their customer, NASA. This first memo is dated February of 1984. This is two years before Challenger, and in part it reads, The recent experience of two burned O-rings on STS-11, that's the 11th shuttle mission, raises concerns with STS-13. You know, when I read this, I wonder how come nobody was concerned about STS-12, my first mission. But apparently, apparently they weren't. I really need to check into that. The O-ring leak check procedure is also an urgent concern. Your support in this urgent matter is requested. Two years before Challenger, the label urgent has been hung on this O-ring design. It's not working. Uh, this next memo was written by Mr. Roger Bougelet in July of 1985, a Thicol engineer. This is six months before Challenger. And in his memo, Mr. Bougelet wrote a very prophetic sentence. And here it is. It is my honest and very real fear that if we do not take immediate action to dedicate a team to solve the problem with the field joint, and that's the O-ring, having the number one priority, then we stand in jeopardy of losing a flight, a crew, and all the launch pad facilities. Mr. Bougelet's prediction was only off 73 seconds. He thought the rocket was going to blow up in the launch pad, destroy the vehicle, kill the crew, and take out the launch pad facilities. He missed it by 73 seconds. Challenger was no accident, folks. Challenger was a predictable surprise.